to Law and Crime's Daily Debrief, everybody. Closing arguments for the defense today in the sex crimes trial of movie producer Harvey Weinstein. Law and Crime's Jesse Weber, himself an attorney, has been in the courtroom for us for much of the trial. Jesse. Yeah, Aaron, we saw the defense's closing argument today from Donna Rotuno. It lasted about four to four and a half hours. She talked about the presumption of innocence, how these jurors agreed to have an objective review of the evidence. She asked them to use their New York City common sense. She said how the prosecution has created a world where these women can't make decisions for their own. They can't make choices on their own. But the main accusers, Jessica Mann and Miriam Halle, these are main accusers who had consensual relationships, not because they were attracted to Harvey Weinstein, but because they wanted to gain something from him. However, she said that their behavior before and after is not what someone who is sexually assaulted would do. For instance, Miriam Halle wouldn't agree to take a trip on the Weinstein Company dime after being attacked and then get a, in a car with a driver that she was worried was Harvey's accomplice if she was really assaulted. Uh, Don Rattuno also moved into the fact that Jessica Mann wasn't afraid of Harvey Weinstein, but was afraid if anyone found out about her secret relationship. She then moved on on to Annabella Shore, talked about how her claims are time barred and how he is not independently charged with Annabella Shore's account and that it's hard to prove a negative 27 years ago that he didn't do this. There were holes in her story, including her behavior. And how was it even possible that Harvey Weinstein got up to her apartment in the first place? Uh, Donna Rattuno claimed that Annabella Shore changed her memories and story to become relevant once again, to become the darling of this Me Too movement. She then moved into the three Molyneux witnesses and say that said that they don't matter. Dawn Dunning only talked about this alleged proposition for a threesome and then only later in 2019 said that she was sexually assaulted by Harvey Weinstein. Tara Lee Wolf doesn't remember anything and had to have a memory recovery expert. Lauren Young, her testimony was contradicted by a key witness. Her stories kept on changing and she was fed information. Now during Donna Rattuno's closing, she regularly mentioned that with these several of these women are represented by Gloria Allred, and she said that Allred is merely looking for a pot of gold at the end of the trial, thereby insinuating referring to civil lawsuits. Uh, here was actually the response from Gloria Allred, as well as Douglas Wigdor, who represents Tara Lay Wolf. Their response as to these women are just out for the money. I think they're kind of desperate. And... That's what it signifies to me. There has been no testimony whatsoever by Mimi that I was retained for the purpose of a civil lawsuit, that she has filed a lawsuit, which she hasn't, that she's going to, the fact that she might or could or would or may or who knows means nothing. So it's an attempt to show bias that maybe somebody would want to be compensated for what they allege is a rape or sexual abuse. And by the way, if anybody does want to be compensated because they've been raped, sexually harassed, sexually abused, well, they should have every right to do so. The cost of the wrong should not be borne by the victim. The cost of the wrong should be borne by the wrongdoer. Judges really ought to put a time limit on closing arguments because this closing argument went on and on and on for hours and hours and hours, longer than any movie that's ever been made. And Ms. Rattuno talks a lot about a production, and that was really a production. She says that facts matter, and I agree, facts do matter. She said that I was at the court today and that Ms. Wolf uh, was, was testifying because she was looking at some point to recover civil compensation money from Harvey Weinstein. She has no civil claim. Her claims are barred by the civil statutes of limitation. So for Ms. Rattuno to get up in front of a jury where there's no evidence in the record otherwise to suggest that Ms. Wolf or myself are here to try and seek compensation uh, from Mr. Weinstein on, be on her behalf is completely disingenuous. Yes, we're seeking civil compensation from my other three clients, but they have absolutely nothing to do um, with, with Ms. Wolf. And I'm confident that when the jury deliberates and they really think about, can six women just conjure up these, these facts um, and, and, and make these things up in order to aid the prosecution, I'm confident that this jury will find beyond a reasonable doubt that Harvey Weinstein's guilty for the crimes for which he's charged. 
So aside from attacking the credibility of these witnesses and their lawyers, we know that Don Rotuno also attacked the state and Jonah Luzzi. Tomorrow, the prosecution delivers their closing, and you know they're going to respond to what Donna Rotuno had to say today. Exactly, Jesse. What was the mood in the courtroom like? Was it harsh? Was it combative? And what was the body language you saw from the jury? The jury was highly attentive during all points. Don Rotuno used the, a PowerPoint to illustrate different text messages or lines of testimony. They were reading everything. They weren't yawning. They paid careful attention. They took notes. The entire courtroom was packed. It was tense when the day started off. There was an excitement in the air. Everybody was waiting to see what would happen. And at the end of the day, after hearing from Harvey Weinstein, he appeared to be uh, very happy with the performance of uh, his, one of his main attorneys, Don Rotuno. Law and Crimes' Jesse Weber live at the courthouse for us tonight here on The Debrief. And here again are the charges Harvey Weinstein faces. The first two counts on your screen here in just a moment relate to accuser Mimi Halle. The last three counts relate to accuser Jessica Mann. Predatory sexual assault charged twice is the most serious charge with a possible life sentence. With me tonight are three attorneys. Let's begin with Anna Carlson and Brian Buckmeyer here in New York. So, uh, Anna, I'll start with you. Was it too much, just enough, or too harsh on these closings from what you know from your analysis? So I don't think it was too harsh at all. I thought it was a powerful closing argument. I think she had a lot of ground to cover. I think she covered it in an interesting way that will really stick with the jury. I really liked her references to um, comparing these incidents to a, a someone alleging to have been kidnapped, then calling her kidnapper and talking about going on a vacation with them. I thought there were a lot of anecdotes that are going to stick with the jury when they go back to deliberate. Donna Rotuno has faced a lot of criticism saying she's somehow betraying her gender by defending Harvey Weinstein. How do you view the criticism? Um, I, I don't think it's a legitimate criticism when it comes to what she's doing in the courtroom. I think her performance in the courtroom is excellent. The, the thing that I think she's doing that's, that's pretty alienating for any woman is talking about, uh, on the record, in press conferences, talking about the fact that she would never put herself in a position to be victimized. Because I think in the year 2020, most people understand anyone can be in that position. Brian Buckmeyer, your analysis. So I'm not going to touch the second question, but the first one, uh, definitely I think she's doing an amazing job. I think it's uh, maybe because we have similar styles, and I think that she's being very persuasive, very powerful, and very strong. And I think, again, as Anna said, it's going to have a lasting effect on the jury. And Brian, uh, at the end of the day, defense attorneys have to defend their clients here, and, and some people might not like it. That's for the jury ultimately to decide there still needs to be a job done. So I, I tell everyone, you cannot pick and choose what constitutional right or what um, laws you want to follow. What you're going to do is you're going to defend people and allow the facts, the law, and the jury to, to come to a conclusion. If we all, prosecutors, defense attorneys, and judges, were there to prosecute people, then many more innocent people will be found in jail than we would have now. And that's a scary thought. And with me tonight from the West Coast, Los Angeles' attorney and trial mediator, Dina Dahl. Dina, your view of this case from the West Coast tonight. You know, I thought her reference there to the fact that these women had attorneys meant that they were seeking a pot of gold was really rich. And the fact that Harvey Weinstein, over so many years, has used his power, his influence, and his money in order to avoid, as we know, many sexual assault claims and settled many sexual assault claims. In this case, he has a whole team of attorneys. The fact that these two women who are getting dredged through the public could not have spokespeople and advisors, and somehow that becomes prejudicial and somehow means that they are out for the money. I didn't like that comment. I think that's going to result in a lot of negative reaction here. Dina, ultimately, do we believe the accusers or do we believe the defense attacks on the accusers? You know, I think that this is the ultimate Me Too case, right? And the thing that bolsters it the most is that you have six women basically saying, Me Too. He also did this really creepy behavior on me. If it was just the two women, the fact that they had friendly at times and sexual encounters with him afterwards is very problematic. But when you have six women saying, me too, yes, he did almost exactly the same thing with me over and over and over, it becomes a lot more compelling to these jurors. 
strength in, strength in numbers rather may add up. Dean Adal, appreciate the insight tonight. Two verdicts to report in cases we've been following this week here on the Law and Crime Network. A Dallas jury decided that police officer Christopher Hess is not guilty of aggravated assault for firing his weapon 12 times and killing 21-year-old Genevieve Dawes. Dawes and her partner tried to flee when police showed up to investigate whether the vehicle they were sleeping in one night was stolen. A state expert said the vehicle was going less than three miles an hour when Hess opened fire. Hess's defense was that he fired to protect himself and other officers from harm. To another verdict now in the Ohio case of a career criminal accused of raping, stabbing and strangling Rachel Anderson on her 24th birthday. Prosecutors say this particular defendant, Anthony Pardon, ordered others to use Anderson's debit card and that his phone was near Anderson's apartment when she was killed. Pardon's DNA also inside the victim's body. Here's the judge reading some of the verdict, which was guilty across the board. Verdict count one, guilty. We the jury being duly empowered and sworn to find the defendant Anthony Pardon guilty of aggravated murder as he stands charged in count one of the indictment. Verdict count two, guilty. We the jury being duly empowered and sworn to find the defendant Anthony Pardon guilty of aggravated burglary as he, as he stands charged in count two of the indictment. Verdict count four, guilty. We the jury being duly impounded and sworn to find the defendant Anthony Pardon guilty of kidnapping as he stands charged in count four of the indictment. Verdict uh, count six, guilty. We the jury being duly impounded and sworn to find the defendant Anthony Pardon guilty of rape as he stands charged in count six of the indictment. Verdict count eight, guilty. <coughs> We, the jury being duly impounded and sworn, do find the defendant, Anthony Parton, guilty of robbery as he stands charged in count eight of the indictment. And still ahead tonight here on The Debrief, an Iowa cold case murder dating back to 1979. The defendant says he's innocent as the state attempts to use very little but DNA to link him to what the state suggests is a random killing. Iowa now for day two of testimony in a cold case murder. Prosecutors in Cedar Rapids say Jerry Burns, now 66 years old, murdered then 18-year-old Michelle Martinko back when Burns was 25. The 40-year-old cold case languished until DNA tests were invented and technology evolved. Detectives finally settled on Burns as a suspect whose DNA they recently collected from a discarded straw at a pizza place. Authorities say DNA on the straw is consistent with DNA extracted from blood left behind at the crime scene. Authorities say Michelle Martinko was stabbed at least eight times in the chest and face and left in her parents' car in a mall parking lot. The blood police recovered was on her clothing and on the vehicle's gear shift. The victim's ex-boyfriend was at the mall where the victim died, buying her a present just before her murder. He's not a suspect, but he did take the stand with this. I had an opportunity to go to the mall and hopefully get in and out and purchase her Christmas gift without her seeing me or knowing that what I got. And we kind of entered in and uh, just, I mean, out of the corner of my eye, I saw her. I mean, she was fairly easily recognizable with the blonde hair and she had on a white rabbit coat that I've recognized. I mean, she mentioned to me that would it be okay if she gave me a phone call, right? And I said, sure, why not? Okay. Um, but th there was nothing that, that triggered any alarm bells in my mind in terms of her behavior or state of mind at the time. After you went home for the night, did you, um, did you have any contact with uh, Michelle's parents later that night that you recall? Yeah, at some point in the evening, uh, Michelle's mom called, uh, called my parents' home and uh, wanted to know if I had heard anything from her. And that's why I said, no, I, have, I hadn't heard anything. And this had now kind of exceeded that threshold timeline of when she said she was going to call. But mm -hmm. I mean, she didn't going to call. She didn't going to call. It did, I, I had no concern at that point until her mom called me. That ex-boyfriend made a previous statement that someone had been watching the victim at work. The defense asked about that on cross-examination. Yes, as a matter of fact, she did. She mentioned that there was someone that had been watching her out there. Did she describe the person? She said, yes, it was the guy was Excuse grotesque. Excuse me. The objection will be overruled. You can proceed. She said what? Uh, the guy was grotesquely ugly. And uh, did she seem intensely bothered? 
by those? She did seem intensely bothered during that week because she was quiet, really quiet, and did not have a whole lot to say to me during the week before her death. And she reported this as concern to you about four days before she died? That's what the document says. That's what you said, right? Yes. And in the uh, four days leading up to when you saw her at the Westdale Mall the day of her, her death, was she quiet during that week? We didn't spend a lot of time together, so that's very difficult for me to, to say one way or the other. Another one of the victim's ex-boyfriends was asked about his whereabouts when the murder occurred. Michelle Martinko dated this man when she was a junior, but broke up with him when he left for college. Yeah, I had classes that day, and then uh, although this wasn't uh, always the case, I do remember I was doing homework uh, in the early part of the evening, and then, um, you know, it was almost midterms, and so there were probably assignments that were due for the middle of that um, semester. And um, later I was uh, hanging out with my roommate and some other friends from our dorm floor, listening to music and just hanging out. Did you talk to law enforcement at some point in time around then? Yes, I, as, you know, um, I can't remember if it was the very next day, but I was getting ready to go back to Cedar Rapids for Christmas. And so as I could, I got my stuff packed up, went back to my folks's, and uh, the next day then we went down to the police station and I just said, you're probably going to want to talk to me because I was her boyfriend. Through our conversations, were you informed that there was a hair that was found in the vehicle that was traced to you? Well, I didn't know until very recently, but yes, I do know that that's the case. And does that surprise you at all? It given? doesn't surprise me at all. The defense wanted to know a lot more about why that ex-boyfriend's hair was in the victim's car. Had you been in her car, of course, the, uh, the, the boat Buick? Yes, many times. And um, had you, on those occasions, driven the car yourself, or was Michelle Martinko driving the car. Mm, I don't ever remember driving it. I could have, but I don't remember ever doing that. And again, like I said, we were much more likely to be in my car with me driving, um, but occasionally it would go the other way. I don't remember driving it. You were interviewed about this investigation back in 1981, and, and <clears throat> as I read the interview, you described her as a terrible driver. <laughs> really bad. That could be true. It's been 40 years. There's a lot of time to forget a lot of things. Okay. So would you acknowledge uh, that at least back then you characterized her as a really bad or terrible driver? Okay. Yeah. I mean, if I said that, I'm sure I meant it back then. I just don't remember. Okay. Things weren't always peaches and cream between the two of you, were they? No. I mean, there was conflicts about other men who she was seeing created some confrontations between you and her. Yes. An officer found the victim's vehicle in a shopping mall parking lot at 4 o'clock in the morning. That officer radioed to headquarters, saw the driver's side rear door was unlocked, and opened it. Well, she was slouched down. Uh, it appeared that there were several stab wounds on her chest. And uh, I remember seeing a laceration on her chin. And she was, there were no signs of life. She was obviously dead. Uh, her dress was pulled up. She appeared to be fully clothed, but her dress was pulled up. Did you notice any body damage to the, to the car? No, I don't remember that. Or any uh, scuff marks or, or scratches on the body of the car? No, I don't remember that. And I didn't make any notes to, those, to that effect in my report. Crime scene investigators were called to examine that car. It's steering wheel in with shift lever, the fibers, there's the blood that this subject is wearing some sort of glove. And that pattern from the glove would have been where it would normally look for fingerprints. Later in the day, I went to the store, purchased a pair of rubber gloves that had a similar pattern, took that back to the station, inked it like it was a fingerprint. It matched 
These were rubber gloves, normal household dishwashing gloves. I was showing the pattern that I found on the interior of the car. And this would have been uh, an impression of the glove that, that you made? Right. It was this appear that the vehicle was driven. The driver's door, the handle of the outside, has the same pattern, not in blood, but in dust that was on the surface of the door handle. Do you believe that the person who murdered Michelle Martinko was wearing the gloves when it occurred? Yes. Let's turn to our panel once again right now. Dina Dahl, it's difficult for the state to try to prove a case basically based on DNA and almost only DNA linking this defendant to the killing. Yeah, exactly. And the fact that they found his DNA from an abandoned straw shows the legal takeaway from this case is how antiquated our privacy and even maybe our search warrant laws are in today's technology. You know, the police said that there was they were able to narrow it down to a small pool of people. My question is, how many other people did they covertly take their DNA before they found a match with Burns? They don't say. Not many because they were narrowing it down based on known relatives and then they focused on this guy. But look, they can collect your DNA if you throw something away. That's the law in this country. Anna Carlson, what's your assessment of the testimony of the ex-boyfriends? I think it was really rich with uh, some detail that the defense is going to exploit. I, uh, my notes here, they talked about uh, hair being shed in the car. I think that is a little preview of an argument we'll see later that if blood was found in the car, that's a match to Jerry Burns that it could have been shed at some other time. We heard from another ex-boyfriend that they had been arguing about the victim seeing other men. I think we may see an argument from the defense that maybe Mr. Burns was one of those other men and his blood came into the car at some other time. Wow, that, that'd be a pretty harsh uh, set of information because my understanding, Brian Buckmeyer, is there's really nothing that links this defendant to this particular victim here. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how they play this out. I think a, a good tagline for this is that the mere presence of DNA inside the car does not make one a murderer or a rapist. Exhibit A, Michael Warrick. I think piggybacking off of that theme and trying to pull apart any motive or connection between the two is going to be the defense's strongest argument. I think that's probably where they're going to go with this. I agree with that assessment. Appreciate the insight from the panel tonight here on The Debrief. Of course, remember, we'll be back here tomorrow with live coverage of the Harvey Weinstein closing arguments from the courthouse in Lower Manhattan. It's the state's turn tomorrow, and we will be there.